Turn now to the book of Ephesians, taking a break from 2 Samuel for this uh, Pentecost Sunday. We'll look at uh, the work of the Holy Spirit in his church in Ephesians chapter 4. have verses 1 through 8 there. I'm going to read verses 1 through 16 uh, because that is the proper context here. Uh, the message is centered around those first really seven verses. This is God's word. I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and gave gifts to men. In saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he had also descended into the lower regions, the earth? He who descended is the one who, is, who also ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth and love, we are to grow up in every way and to him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together, by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. The word of the Lord. Let's pray. And Father, we pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts will be acceptable in your sight. The Lord, our rock and our redeemer, help us to see the work of the Spirit and the unity of the church. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Well, as we were working through John, uh, we read passages and considered passages that spoke of the coming of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus knew that the disciples would be concerned that he was going to leave earth and ascend back to heaven. And he wanted to uh, assure them that they would not be alone. But it's easy to think, as we, when we uh, consider Jesus sending the Holy Spirit after he ascends into heaven, that the Holy Spirit was something of a, a consolation prize. Uh, it was sort of like uh, when uh, Dad gets ready to leave on a long trip, and so he, he gives his little kid a teddy bear to you know, something to remember him by uh, while he's gone. But that, of course, doesn't even come close to why the Spirit came. And the Holy Spirit is often mysterious to us. Uh, we see lots of references to the Spirit throughout the Bible. Uh, but his work can be a little harder to get our hands on, to, to sort of wrap our minds around. Uh, Jesus' work is pretty clear, right? He, uh, he's the second person of the Trinity. Uh, that is, he's God, who is clothed in flesh, uh, such that he's now God and man forever. He came to this earth, he died for our sins, he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven as our forerunner. Uh, he ascended into heaven as the only man who ever made it to heaven on his own merits. Uh, and the only one who could because he was also God. And yet his human presence before God is the reason we humans are able to stand before God and have confidence that he loves us if we receive his gift of salvation by faith. And that, also, that all seems to be enough, right? That sort of seems to be plenty. <laughs> what else do we need uh, other than this? And yet the Bible also tells us that the Son, uh, and the Father and the Son sent the Holy Spirit to us. Why was that necessary? Well, there are a lot of reasons we could point to. 
uh, the, the typical uh, Pentecost passage is the day of Pentecost uh, that we read about in Acts chapter 2. Uh, this is where the Spirit came to send the gospel through the church to the whole world, where the Spirit uh, came to indwell uh, believers. Uh, we also saw from our study of John that uh, the Spirit comes to, uh, came to convict us of sin, uh, came to uh, point us to the only answer to our sin, to Jesus Christ. Uh, but there's one aspect of the Spirit's work that I want to look at today, and that is that the Spirit binds us together. The Spirit unifies us. Unity is, of course, something that people have sought for thousands of years. Uh, there's something inherent in us. There's, there's something that, that makes us uh, think that being together is better than being apart. Uh, uh, that being at peace with each other is, being, uh, is better than being at war with each other. And that's obvious to anyone whose uh, you know, conscience isn't so seared so that they think that conflict is uh, preferable to friendship. And yet we have a world that, uh, despite all of its cries for unity, will, will cry peace and then put a gun to your head. Peace or else. Uh, there's an ideal that no one seems able to achieve. And it started with the sin of Adam and Eve uh, in the garden, which alienated humanity from God and caused us to begin looking to humanity to find that peace. This was made worse at the Tower of Babel, uh, another common passage uh, looked at at Pentecost. Uh, in Genesis 11, uh, we, hear, we read the story and all the people spoke the same language. And uh, uh, with that same language, they were, uh, they were able to unionize, so to speak. And they engaged in a building project, a building project to build a temple to themselves, a temple to humanity. Humanity had unity in that sense, but it was unity apart from and actually against God. And so God judged them by confusing their language so that they couldn't speak to anybody or couldn't speak to each other any longer. And they were forced to disband and scatter over the face of the earth. It's that very thing that the Spirit's work in Acts 2 came to undo, but uh, it only did this for the church. And so the early apostles and believers were given the ability to speak in languages not their own so that the church could spread over the whole earth, so that unity in Christ could be found on every part of the globe. Since we're inclined by nature to hate God and our neighbor, part of the crucial work of the Spirit in us then is to cause us to love God and to love our neighbor. I say both because both loving God and neighbor are essential for true unity to exist. You can't love your neighbor if you don't love God. This was the judgment that the Babel folks uh, had brought down on them. Because they didn't love God, they, were, they would not be able to love their neighbor. They could have some form of unity in love with one another, but since they didn't love God, Love with each other was made impossible. And every unity project that has occurred since then has failed miserably. I think of uh, Rene Descartes, the 17th century philosopher who tried to unify our humanity on the basis of something other than God. There were these wars going on, and, and they were wars of religion that were happening. And so he thought, well, God must not be the answer. We have to find some other place to find the basis of our unity. And so he boiled down the ground of our existence to that phrase, uh, his famous phrase, I think, therefore, I am. In other words, the human mind was the most basic thing we could count on to connect us to one another. And so human unity should be based in ourselves and not on God, on a God that we could not see. Immanuel Kant followed him and said that he was sure of two things, the starry heavens above and the moral law within. Again, locating our certainty in things that we can see and think. And what this did was it cut God out of the picture completely. Man was elevated to the position of primary importance. And once the thought of these two men, along with others, 
institutionalize the pride of mankind, the bloodshed that has resulted has far outstripped all the bloodshed of all the centuries that preceded it. But it also is true that if, while it's true that if you cannot uh, love your neighbor, if you do not love God, it works the other way too. If you, don't, if you do not love your neighbor, you do not love God. 1 John 4.20 says that if anyone who says, I love God and yet hates his brother, he's a liar. Love of neighbor is impossible without God, but love of God is also impossible if you do not love your neighbor. And this is what the Spirit came to do. The Spirit came to cause us to love both, to love each other. And so those who do not have the Spirit are not able to have true unity with one another. Therefore, the only place where unity, true unity, is possible it's within the church, among the people of God. And the work of Christ brings us into fellowship and friendship with God and with each other in the body of the church. Uh, the biggest thing that the disciple, that Jesus wanted to impress on his disciples before he went to the cross was their love for each other. And not just for their mission as disciples and as apostles, because, but because this was to be the hallmark of the church this was supposed to be the thing that people saw when they looked at the church from the outside. Our love for God and for each other. And yet we so often see a lack of that unity, a lack of love between brothers and sisters in the church. And I won't go into all the different ways and we see this, but uh, uh, hang around for five minutes in the world of Christianity and you will see it. Some of this is due to the fact that a lot of what passes today church isn't really the church. That's a topic for another time. But the rest of it is due to the fact that the church is in fact still full of sinners. And I guess I take a bit of encouragement from Paul uh, that he had to deal with this among the churches that he founded. Uh, the words we read from Ephesians 4 speak to this. You know, when Paul says something, he says it because he has to say it. He doesn't just talk about theoretical uh, possibilities that might exist out there. He's, uh, if, if, if these things weren't a concern, he wouldn't have to say anything about it. And so Paul spends quite a bit of time in the whole book of Ephesians talking about the work of the Spirit in binding Christians together. If the work of Christ is the material that saves us, the Holy Spirit is the glue, so to speak, that makes it stick. And makes it and, and holds it all together. The key phrase in the passage we're looking at this morning is in verse three, is verse three, that we be eager to maintain the unity of the spirits in the bond of peace. And that phrase is the culmination of uh, the two verses before it. And it's a rather awkward sounding phrase. And what's striking about it to me is that it's, it's prison language. Notice in verse 1 that Paul is writing as a, a prisoner. And as a prisoner, he has some ready-made illustrations around him. Uh, primarily guards and chains and uh, the lack of freedom to do what he wants. And the English obscures the, the prison language here a bit. But he, he, he writes in verse 3, uh, uh, the, the, the Greek words behind this, uh, what he literally writes in verse 3 is that we should be eager to guard the unity of the Spirit in the chains of peace. The word bond there means chains, and it has the same root word as the word for prison. So what's Paul saying here? He's telling us we're all in jail together. Uh, we're all bound to each other. Uh, but the way we're, not, we're bound together is not with cold iron chain like Paul was in that prison, but with peace. This is why we're able to, uh, why we are to conduct ourselves with humility and gentleness and patience. You know, humility wasn't considered a virtue in uh, Roman times, and I don't think it is today either. Uh, by humility, we mean lowliness. It's more than deference to others. It's actually 
uh, putting others ahead of yourself. As Philippians 2.3 says, counting others as more significant than yourself. And we have to remember that since we're all chained together in this jail, so to speak, it means we're all in the same condition. We have to walk humbly. What does that suggest about how we treat other believers? Augustine said, men are hopeless creatures, and the less they concentrate on their own sins, the more interested they become in the sins of others. They seek to criticize, not to correct. Unable to excuse themselves, they're ready to accuse others. The key to humility is to consider our own sin and weakness before we condemn the sins and weaknesses of others. Along with this, Paul mentions gentleness. You know, uh, if you're chained to other people, uh, you can only move as fast as the slowest person. You have to walk gently. I think that's one reason why Paul uses the language of walking in verse 1. We're walking together. Not only are we in jail together, but we are also uh, chained as far as to one another. And we're walking together. Not outpacing one another. Not outdoing one another, except in words of service to one another. The Christian life is not a race for most holy. It's a race, yes, but it's a race with not against our brothers and sisters as we head to the finish line. And so Paul says this all must be done with patience, bearing with one another in love. You know, that phrase really means uh, putting up with, the bearing with, uh, putting up with one another in love. Bearing one, with one another sounds nicer. It sounds like well, we just, we bear with one another's weaknesses. But what Paul has in mind here is something more like uh, putting up with dummies. Uh, I know that's not a nice thing to say. Kids, don't say that. But you think it. We all do. It's not just putting up with them at a distance, but loving them right beside us. It's another hard virtue. It's easy to, one that's easy to think that you're doing it until someone else comes along, and then it's really hard to actually do it. Because we have expectations, right? We expect that our brother or sister should be more like us. They should be better than they are. They should toughen up or settle down or stop being weird. They might consider looking to our exemplary behavior to know how to live. They should definitely remove that speck from their eye. I'm getting along just fine with this tree in mind. It all seems like a lot. Right? The, 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 these commands, these calls to, to, to put up with each other, to, to bear with one another, to uh, uh, be humble with one another and gentle with one another, seems like a lot. And it is. It's actually impossible. But again, consider the prison language that Paul is using. Back to verse 1, he says, I therefore a prisoner, and it's in, not for, I'm a prisoner in the Lord. He didn't go to prison for Jesus. He's in prison with Jesus. He's in prison because of Jesus. In chapter 3, he calls himself a prisoner of Jesus. That's not just his condition in a Roman prison. It's our condition as well. We are prisoners in the Lord with one another. That's why we're called, uh, we're to walk worthily of the calling to which we have been called. What is that calling? It's the call to salvation. Do we call ourselves to salvation? No. When God calls to that, when God calls to that salvation, does that call ever fail? Romans eight thirty: Those whom He called, He also justified. Those whom He justified, He also glorified. This call to His chosen ones never fails. And so we're to walk worthily of the condition that we are already in. See, the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace is not an ideal to be pursued. It's a reality to be embraced. If you're in jail, you don't try to be as much in jail as you can be. You're either in jail or you're out of jail. There's one or the other. Our condition is more like one where we are in jail, so we want to be in jail the best we can be. 
We want to be model prisoners, so to speak. I realize that prisoner imagery might sound kind of jarring because we like to talk about our freedom in Christ. And yet, this imprisonment, the great irony, the way Paul speaks, uh, really throughout Ephesians and even in his other books, uh, the, this imprisonment by the Spirit actually is freedom. The chains that bind us together are chains of his peace. It's true freedom because it can never be taken away. We're bound together by a peace that has been given to us. And we can rest in the work of the Spirit in our hearts because His work is to make us like the Jesus who died for us and sent that Spirit to ensure that we make it safely to our final destination. Eternal life with Him forever. So that desire for, un for unity that humanity has always had is actually achievable and in fact is a reality in Christ by the power of the Spirit. And so if that's prison, then I'm okay with it. It's a prison that sets you free. That's the other reason Paul uses the language of walking in verse 1. We're to walk worthily of the condition we've been called in. He was in a literal physical jail with chains around his feet, and yet he could walk. Because his outward physical circumstances were insignificant compared to the freedom that he had in Christ. His body was in chains, but his heart was free. Free to serve others, free to pray for others, free to love others. He didn't let being in an actual prison stop him from glorifying God by serving the believers to whom he was bound. So you can't escape this prison of the Holy Spirit. Paul could and did escape the Roman prison uh, from time to time, but he did it because the strength of his bond with other believers was stronger. And it was stronger not because he was stronger, not because he loved harder than anybody else, but because the Holy Spirit binds with chains that cannot be broken. And it sounds suffocating to be in this kind of prison. It sounds stifling. It makes you worry that, oh, well, I'm stuck with these people. They drive me nuts. We consider the, the fact that the same Holy Spirit that binds you to all these weird people is the same Holy Spirit that binds you to Christ. Paul goes on with uh, what is likely an early Christian creed, whether he's creating it here or repeating something uh, already been, that's already been used, and we don't know. But he says in verse 4 there is one body and one spirit. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. It's a sentence that builds, and it, it starts from us and goes to God, but, but read, what, read it backwards to see what is happening. One God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one spirit, and one body. From the Father's decree and plan of all eternity comes Christ that joins us with himself in baptism and faith. And the Spirit who is sent to bind us all together with the Father and the Son into one body. And so we're called the body of Christ. It's not just that we're bound to each other, but that God through his Son, by his Spirit, really binds himself to us. We're not bound by anything we have, ourselves have done, but by the peace of God we have through the blood of Christ. And so what do we bring to God when he binds himself to us? What do we bring into Christ's church, into his body? We bring our sickness and our weirdness and our sin. These are the people, we are the people, that God has bound himself to. And yet, despite our weirdness and the difficulty that we bring into God's church, we're not brought in begrudgingly. I've said this before. It doesn't just bring us in and say, okay, fine, you can be here. No, he actually gives us presents. When he binds us to himself, he gives us gifts. Verse 7, grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. And what are these gifts? They're, they're gifts that if you, as we read through to verse 16, they're gifts that make the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. 
As with everything that God does for his people, everything required of us is given to us. We merely need to walk together in the paths of love that he has made for us, energized by the Spirit who strengthens us by word and sacrament as he draws us to himself. So far from the Holy Spirit being some sort of magical being who pops up from time to time, he is the very atmosphere of the Christian life. The air that we breathe, he is the all-surrounding, all-encompassing bringer of the grace of God to our lives and through each of us brings that grace to our brothers and sisters around us. He binds us together in Christ, guarantees our inheritance in him, and brings us safely along the way. Let's go to him in prayer. Our Father, we thank you for the mercy that you have shown to us that though we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, and that you by your Spirit now indwell our hearts, binding us to yourself and to one another. We pray that you would help us to embrace the reality of the unity that we have. That we would see that we already have unity with one another. And we would desire to walk in the good works that you have given to us in which to walk. So that we might love one another well and love you. We pray these things in Christ's name.